All right. Welcome to the next talk in our series. Uh, right now, we've got Mohammed Makbel up here to speak on the SPF shell framework, so please welcome him to the TourCon stage. Thanks, everyone. Uh, I'm Mohammed Makbel, and today I'm going to be presenting Shell Peak Application Sophisticated Interactive Shell Framework. So in case you're wondering what the word forming element, the, the first character in it, the character F, why it's capitalized. It's literally for no particular reason other than the fact that I want an acronym that is three characters minimum. So <laughs> that's it. Uh, yeah, I come from Toronto, Canada, and I promised that I come in peace and I'm bringing no cold. Otherwise, we'd be all frozen by now. So <laughs> that's that. Is there anyone from Canada here? No? Oh, wow. I came all by myself then. Okay, bit of information about me. I'm security researcher and trend micro at the Bing Point. I'm a member of the Digital Vaccine Lab. Uh, I do reverse engineering, primarily malware uh, vulnerabilities, and write uh, filters for uh, tipping point next gen IPS. I'm a former student security senior security investigator at CIBC, one of the top five banks in Canada. So I was an L3, I was doing investigation, reverse engineering. Um, I also was former uh, reverse code, code engineer and malware researcher at Data Security Lab for about five years. I'm mainly interested in reverse engineering and malware research, intrusion detection, prevention systems, and I have a special interest in C++, as well as compiler and software performance analysis. And in general, I'm interested in information security and what comes out underneath it. And as a part of my involvement in reverse malware reverse engineering, I got to see a lot of interesting exotic communication channels slash protocols. So that, that alone worth a, a separate talk. So this is the first slide in the talk. I promise that the talk is not about Wireshark display filters. So don't get, get discouraged. Uh, but I just want to make sure that you know what are display filters in Wireshark, right? Can anyone tell me what this display filter is supposed to do? No, okay, so all it does is that it's checking for HTTP POST request with the fact that you have a content length header in the request set to zero, yet there is a payload. Does it make sense? Of course it doesn't make sense, right? It doesn't even adhere to the RFC specifications. This is just like a bit of introduction. So this is the kind of uh, display filters you write for Wireshark. And now we have D-Shark. D-Shark is the console version of Wireshark, right? And this is the, this is how you would invoke it. R takes PCAP file, and Y is where you write your display filter. As simple as that. And here, remember, I'm talking about display filters. There is a difference between display filters and capture filters. So the display filters work with a static PCAP file that you're already analyzing. Capture filter works, works in real time. As you're capturing traffic, you're filtering it. So that's a different talk. Uh, now that we know what, what is Wireshark, what is T-Shark, let's go to Windows Command Processor, the holy grail of who runs and controls all. Okay. Again, the talk is not about CMD. I just wanted to set the stage for what, what's coming next. And to automate some of your tasks, uh, in CMD, you would use what's known as those key macros, right? It's extremely limited, and it doesn't give you much of uh, uh, features to automate your tasks in a generic way, right? Or at least in a de democratized fashion. So what is the motivation for this talk? I know this sounds weird, the first point, but literally, I wanted to explore 
the new feature in C++ 11 and 14? And what is better than starting a new project from scratch, right? And testing different stuff. And I am a heavy user of Wireshark. I literally use it on a daily basis, except, of course, for Saturday and Sunday. Otherwise, I wouldn't have a life. <laughs> and I wanted something more than add a display filter button. I'm sure whoever is familiar with Wireshark, so when you write a display filter, if you want to save it for later on, you just have to, to the right, there is a plus sign where you save it under a name. And that's how you automate your uh, invocation of display filters. Uh, and of course, it is a pleasure on working something in you, starting from scratch, uh, from designing, architecting, engineering, testing, and documentation. Like the entire process. Uh, this is a personal project. The agenda for this talk is as follows. I'll be introducing the framework itself, why I created it, features, internals, how it works, and how to write constructs. This is what I call construct. I'll see later on what they mean. And how, and in, most importantly, how this framework will help you achieve the following. Simplification of repetitive tasks, automation of exploit kit detection. Well, I don't provide uh, a solution for that. It is for you to come and write different display filters. And of course, the framework itself helps you in building self-contained and easy to manage self-explanatory units slash constructs. Uh, yeah, and the rest goes along. So what is SPF? In a nutshell, SPF is a shell framework that provides sophisticated abstraction layer with seamless interaction for t shark and Windows Command Shell Interpreter. Uh, it features a new custom developed language. It's a declarative language called Eros that I developed for this framework. And in case you're wondering what Eros stands for, it's literally in reference to the Greek god of love, procreation, and sexual desire. <laughs> that is the, I just like uh, Greek stuff, uh, Greek history, so that's why I chose this name. And of course, you have a framework, you have a shell, and you have a language, right? So how would you inter interact with the framework and the shell? Of course, there is a set of built-in helpful commands that allows you to interact with the language itself in a dynamic way. So how this interaction with T-Shark and CMD is accomplished? This is accomplished through two unique constructs that are part of the language. And I define them under the following names. SPF is for uh, T-Shark, and WIN is for interacting with CMD. This will become clearer later on in the slides. I know now it's very abstract. And these constructs constitute the knowledge base of the framework. So the more you write of these constructs, the better it is the framework in terms of what you can achieve with it. So first we'll address the first construct, that is SPF construct. And this is the skeleton of the construct. Okay, so first you have SPF, then you have the name. You have to give it a name, right? And then followed by the logic definition. The logic definition takes display filter logic. So you have to be good at writing T-Shark display filters. The better you are, the better is the SPF contract at doing what's supposed to do. And, yet, and you have to write a semantically and syntactically correct display filters because the language itself does not verify the semantics of the display filter that you write through the framework. It is being verified by T-Shark itself and not the framework. Info, the keyword info is literally you are giving this construct a help uh, statement, that's all. And for tag, this is when you want to search for a uh, different set of constructs in your framework uh, like in a non-hierarchical fashion, so you just give it a tag. For example, you give one, one construct HTTP, the author, and what's supposed to do. And the tag uh, keyword is optional. 
you don't have to have it in the construct. Whereas the others, they have to be present. And this is in, an, in a nutshell SPF construct. This is as simple as that. And mind you, each of these keywords, they are accessible from the shell, from SPF shell later on. You can inspect each one of them, and you can update the logic one, at least dynamically, uh, sorry, in memory. And then for win construct, it is the same as SPF construct. Ah, oh, sorry, uh, I'm moving way ahead. So this is an example of what an SPF contract looks like, right? So I give it a name, first one is get URI, right? The logic of this construct is the display filter that tells it, okay, check for all HTTP request methods uh, that are get and print to the console the fields that is the request URI. It is as simple as that, right? So I'm automating it uh, to do this for me. So I don't want to type it every time I use this particular display filter, right? And I'm giving it a, a help and a tag. It is as simple as that. On the other side, for the win construct, uh, it's the same as uh, SPF constructs, except that at the evaluation and execution uh, steps, they take different uh, paths. Like this is internally speaking. But it is the same as uh, SPF construct. And of course, uh, you cannot write uh, T shark display filters in these constructs because these gets executed by Windows CMD, right? Whereas SPF constructs are handled by T shark. And with win constructs, you can do whatever you want, whatever you can run via your CMD, anything. Here I'm simply calling this WMIC uh, command, which gives me the OS architecture. As simple as that. Ah, so we have these two constructs. Okay, you can write as many constructs as you want, right? They are available from the shell but how can we generalize their use in such a way that when I call a given construct, I want to be able to uh, input an argument that would influence the output of the construct, right? So I want to parameterize it. To do that, here, through the power of Eros language, we can use a set of input operators, right? So as of this version, the language supports a couple of input operators that allows you to parameterize the logic of your constructs. So first I have the input operator arg. Arg is simply CN. If you're familiar with C language, just a simple CN and takes whatever value. So you can place this arg input operator anywhere in the logic definition and when you invoke that construct, the construct, the shell itself, is expecting you to give it a value that will be put in place where this arg input operator is located in the logic definition. This will become clear later on. And now, I think this is the most powerful input op operator. So the arg one takes only one value, right? It's always from the shell. Now, I needed something more generic more powerful, something that will execute different contents all at once for me. So I introduce this list operator. It takes the content of a text file. So when you use this construct, this operator in your construct, what's gonna happen is the following. Uh, so first you give it a file name of where your data is stored on disk. And every time there is an execution of that construct that references this list file. It's gonna pull one entry from the, from the file and execute it one at a time. So it's gonna be executed in, in an iterative manner. And of course, it is reasonable to say that there can exist only one instance of this operator per construct, right? Otherwise, it doesn't make sense.
And furthermore, you can generalize it. So the file name need not be hard-coded. You can input it from the shell, should you choose to, via the arg input operator. So that was a natural conclusion, technically. And of course, so you have this operator, but the data in the text file that you're referencing, every time you get a hit on any entry in the shell, in the output, you need to know which one it is hitting on, right? So to do that, you can assign to every entry in the text file this particular print operator with a specific message. Okay, so every time you get a hit on the data part, the, the message is gonna get printed in the shell and it gives you the output. It is as simple as that. So the data part contains the data part that will be put in the logic definition of where the list operator is referenced, as we'll see later on. So what can you do with list operator? What possibilities it open for you? Simply, you can use it, you can store list of suspicious or anomalous user agents because you don't wanna, in your construct, you go on a hard code and the entire list in the logic definition. And you can uh, have a list of malicious slash suspicious SSL TLS certificates. If you know a malware that's communicating with a bad side. Uh, and of course, in case you're wondering, recent versions of T-Shark, they allow you to parse the entire certificate, every field. Previous versions, you weren't allowed to do that at all. You would have to extract it manually and then do all the stuff. And of course, grouping. So if you have a malware family and each variant of that family has a uh, different communication protocol or they differ slightly, so of course, why not group them in one list file instead of creating a construct for each variant? Okay, so now we know about a SPF and win construct, and we have a list of input op operators to interact with these constructs from the shell, or s at least to generalize their use. Now, how can we even make it better? If you want to build uh, one construct on top of the other, right? Just like in uh, any functional language, right? You call functions, but this is declarative language, right? So I need to introduce more operators. This following operator is called the call operator. So you have a construct, right, that performs specific function, right? And you have another construct. But that construct, the new one, inherits some of the logic in the other construct. So you don't want to write it again. So instead of rewriting it, you just call it, right? As simple as that. And this is done through the call operator call and you give it the SPF construct that you already wrote. And the same it goes with the win construct. And mind you, from SPF, you can call win constructs, but not the other way around. Why is that? Because win construct gets executed by Windows CMD, whereas SPF constructs, again, gets executed by t -shark. So from execution perspective, they are handled differently. So this is the call operator. So, and again, to point it out, call operators contain a fully functional, they reference, sorry, they reference fully functional constructs. They are meant to reference fully functional construct that can be executed on their own, not as macros, okay? What if you want to have just macros that cannot be executed on their own, but just for documentation, clarity, uh, and visibility in your code, you might need something else other than call uh, operators. For that, I also have what's known as 
global auxiliary logic definitions. So these definitions, they are global with universal lexical scope. They are non-executable named statements that can be used, of course, with SPF and win constructs for as, as building blocks. So again, you cannot execute these logical definitions on their own. They meant to be referenced by other constructs. They are just macros, literally as simple as that. And this is the syntax for a logic definition. For example, if I, it always has to start with an L, capital letter, followed by dot, followed by the name of the uh, auxiliary logic, followed by the logic. As simple as that. So how would you reference this auxiliary logic in your construct? How would you call it, right? So I need another operator for that. For that, I use the insert operator, just like in your uh, SQL statements or whatever other declarative language. So to reference a given auxiliary logic definition, we use the insert operator. So whenever SPF parser finds an instance of this insert operator statement in the logic definition, it's going to be replaced of whatever it is uh, defined. Okay, so let us say you have a set of constructs. You have 10, right, that you execute uh, one after the other always, right? So you go to the shell, let me call get your I construct followed by another one, another one, another one, right? And you keep doing this again and again and again. So you want to automate this process, right? So how would you do that? You do it through what's known as multi-command unit. So this allows you to group the calling of different constructs uh, in one, uh, how to say, like in one statement, and they will get executed on your behalf one after the other. It is a, just a matter of regrouping them. And of course, since uh, the execution happening through Windows CMD, you can use whatever Windows CMD provides. And all of these constructs, again, they are accessible from the shell, as we will see later on. So here's, here's an example of an NCU unit. So for example, I give it the name test, right? And here I'm printing to the console this message, the echo message, and then I'm calling the construct, the SPF construct get you URI with the argument get, and printing another message to the console and calling the uh, win construct arc. So I go to the shell, SPF shell, and I execute this MCU unit under the name test, and it's gonna call all these, uh, it's gonna do all these things for me. It's just a way of automating your task, that's all there is to it. I guess we're all, and also to generalize your uh, write-up of constructs, if you want to group, group them in different translation units, by that I mean different files, like one for malware, one for vulnerabilities, one for suspicious user agents or whatever, you can also use the include preprocessor directive, right? Just like in C right now, the language, you are at the liberty of using this directive anywhere you want, and there is no restriction at all. Uh, you can use it in a nested way or whatever. It's fully supported. Okay, now from the shell, uh, you need uh, a way to interact with these constructs, right? How would you do that? That has to be a set of commands implemented in the shell, in the SPF shell in particular. And these shells, they are known as helpers, it's not help, so you can't just go type help in the shell and expect to get a list of all these commands because if you type help, it's gonna be, it's not part of uh, 
SPF commands is going to be handled by Windows CMD, and then you're going to get the list of help files supported by CMD. So that's why I'm making it helper. And these helper functions, as a conduit interact with defined SPF CMDs and the shell itself in a dynamic way. So before going any further into the constructs, there are two important files in the, in the framework. We have the configuration file, and the main uh, uh, SPF command translation unit. But first, we'll, we'll start talking about the configuration file and the list of options it contains and how it can influence the execution of the framework depending on whatever value it gives you, you give each of the options. So this is the list of uh, options in the configuration files. And the first one is we have SPF command, command file path. So you literally just give it a path to your main command file where you have your construct stored. We'll see later on why this option even exists. And then we have the path to your T-Shark executable. And then we have a path that you can set for all your PCAP, right? So this will be like the default path to all PCAPs. So you don't have to set it every time you uh, when I work with a given PCAP from the shell. It's already set for you. And in case you have a default PCAP name that you always work with, or every time you download a PCAP, it gets saved under a specific name, you can also give it a default PCAP name. Uh, now the option load command SPF file. So this one allows you to load and parse everything stored in it. All, all of your constructs that are stored in the CMD file at runtime. So at the time when you ex execute the shell, the framework itself, it's going to load all the constructs in that file, parses it, validate it, and makes it available for you at runtime. So you can turn it on or off. If you turn it off, you're going to have to do it from the shell through another command. And then the history. This also takes a Boolean value. Uh, well, here first, the first option is, this is where you want to store all your uh, historically executed commands. You can store them on disk. And the load history file, this one allows you to either to load it at runtime or not. So. So how would you use the shell then? So since we've introduced all of these constructs and the input operators and the language and everything, so how would you use it? Like what would be a typical workflow when you get a PCAP? For that, we have the following workflow, which is facilitated by the helper commands. So first, uh, when you execute the shell, the SPF shell, you have to give it the name of your PCAP that you want to work with, right? And to do that, just set PCAP or get PCAP. It's just a matter of inspecting uh, different variables. The get PCAP path is, uh, does not change the value in the configuration file, only in, in memory. Sorry, the, the, the set PCAP path. The set PCAP, get PCAP, I think they are self-explanatory, except when you want to execute a given construct against multiple PCAPs, right? So you're not going to execute the same construct against every PCAP one by one, right? So for that, you can set the PCAP name to uh, start AF, which stands for all files followed by another star. Then every time you execute a construct, it's going to go check every PCAP in that directory. And this is where what I'm talking about in, regarding the uh, command file, where you can either uh, parse it and validate it at runtime or from the shell. 
So why this is important? Because you're already inside the shell and you want to update some of the constructs, right? So you're not gonna close your shell and then execute it again just to get everything validated again. So by, just by typing load command file, it's gonna uh, redo the same thing again for you. Get all commands is literally responsible for showing you all the key, the constructs you defined. And you have a list of other uh, commands that allows you to inspect every keyword, every keyword of the construct, the name, the logic, the list of tags supported, and other things. And also you have commands for inspecting the history of all commands you type, and you can even execute uh, multiple historical commands all at once through the uh, helper command exh. And if you still remember what is an MCU is, <laughs> uh, the multi-command unit, uh, this is how you would call a given one, through the command exmcu. And get MCU list gets you a list of all defined MCU. I know this is all abstract now. <laughs> Unfortunately, is, there is no <laughs> easier way to uh, make it accessible until I show you like a demo. Okay, so for SPF construct, we already know how it looks like. We know how it works. We know its functionality. Let us say I define an SPF construct, but I have no reason at all to show it in the shell. So when I say, when I type, get all commands, which gonna give me the list, the list of all constructs that I define in, the, in, in my file, in my CMD file, I want some of the construct not to show up, right? Because they either have no functional interpretation uh, or they are of no use for me. So for that, there is another uh, thing I call specifier height. So the specifier height allows you literally to hide this construct from the shell. You can still call it, reference it, do whatever you want with. But whenever you call get all commands, it won't show up in the list. It is just as simple as that. And this is for clarity for management purposes. Okay, so now we'll start with examples, which should make it uh, easier to understand. So for example, this SPF construct is supposed to uh, detect some patterns of a given exploit kit, right? And in this particular example, we detect, uh, uh, from what I recall, which, what, what exploit kit? Let me see. Uh, I forgot actually, but we'll see later on. Uh, okay, so in the logic definition, we have the display filter, HTTP request.uri. So here I'm inspecting what? The URI. And against what? Against the list of entries defined in the text file ek regex, right? Because I'm gonna have multiple regexes. So I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna store every regex here in the, in the logic definition. This is not manageable, right? So what's in that text file? This is what it contains. So in this case, here, I have the following entry in the text file. First, I have the print statement, if you still remember, which can print to the console the message. We have a, a match against Angular URI test pattern, okay? Every time I get a match against the following regex. So this regex, will match against uh, Angular exploit kit URI pattern, okay? So let's say you have a nuclear exploit kit URI pattern, right? You simply add another answer to the text file, you give the message, first you use the print statement, 
you give it a message, nuclear URI test pattern, and then you give it the uh, regex pattern against that particular exploit gets, right? And when you invoke this construct, EKD, it's gonna test each one consecutively in sequence, right? It is as simple as that. And here's another example. Uh, I'm not sure how many of you come from a corporate environment, and you all know uh, that you can't just set your DNS server to use a public DNS server, right? You can just go and use uh, Google, right? Usually you have your own DNS for water, right? So malware, what they, they usually do is, uh, when they send a DNS request, they use Google DNS server instead of going through your network DNS server. This is just like one of the evasion techniques they use, right? So let's say you have a set of PCAPs and you wanna check every DNS request where the DNS uh, uh, server is any of those in this list, DNS server.txt file. So I grabbed that list from this URL and the guy seems to keep it up to date actually. Like as of August he has updated it, which is interesting. So the logic definition here is clear. I'm checking destination host, right? It has to match either of those in this list, and the protocol is DNS. And, the, and to the console, print to me the frame num number that matches this DNS entry, the source, the source IP, destination IP, and the DNS name, the actual domain name. And for example, this is what the uh, DNS server.txt file would contain, right? For Google DNS server, they have these two entries. And of course, it contains other. And also more examples. I have this example called ephemeral port less than 1024. I'm not sure how much you're familiar with the RFC, but the source port for your connection, whenever you make a connection, is it's randomly assigned, or generated, I should say, right? And from zero to 1023, they are reserved, right? Why I'm talking about this in first place? Because I did a small experiment where, okay, I have like about, I had about uh, 400 uh, malicious speakups, and I wanted to see if any, in, if in any of those speakups, I have the source port that is less than 1024, right? Because it's not RFC compliant. So for me to automate this process, it is as simple as using this display filter, right? By writing this construct. And here what I'm checking for, just the TCP source port has to be less than 1024. And this check is only valid uh, when I make a uh, SYN connection. But it, because it can be any SYN request, right? SYN request can be sent out outside of the TCP handshake. So it has to be through the connection. And of course, the logic also can be done with the other option that I'm listing in the, in the comment. So you can also use comment with your construct. But it's just the other way around. But it's as simple as that. And to my surprise, I found actually uh, malware that have the source port is less than 1024. And why? Turns out some of the malware family, especially the, uh, the ones that uh, perform denial of service attack, especially when they want to perform some sin flooding, right? They construct the packet byte by byte, right? And these people usually don't care about the specification. This is one way of identifying it. And you have another example where I found out they ha I, I had PCAPs where um, some of them are generated by FakeNet. Are you familiar with FakeNet? So FakeNet is literally just to uh, simulate some of, your, some of your traffic. For example, if you're making a GET request, so instead of going to the actual server, just replies with whatever is provided by FakeNet for you. So it 
doesn't reach the answer at all, right? So for fake net, also it has such anomaly. Uh, it's it's on pcaps. Uh, it doesn't even have uh, 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 the physical uh, the the frame header as well, right? So it also so technically it doesn't uh, adhere to the specification. Another example to give you uh, some of the usage of the, of the of the framework and some of the operators. Have you ever heard of the Black Nurse Denial of Service attack? You've heard of it? Okay, awesome. So this one is literally as simple as sending ICMP requests with type three and code three. This is all it needs to succeed. However, the limitation is you would have to send it uh, at a rate of 40 to 50,000 per second. Uh, it affects hardware devices from firewalls to routers. Let's say you have a PCAP and you want to check for this uh, particular attack, right? So how would you do it? It's as simple as writing this construct, right? So here first I'm creating this first two mac macros. Uh, auxiliary logic definitions, if you still remember, where I'm giving for the destination unreachable one the value of three and the port unreachable the value of three. This is just for adding clarity to your construct, right? Otherwise, I would have used just these numbers, literally the numbers, right? In the display filters, there is no macros for these numbers, right? So here I'm just adding clarity to the construct. And in the logic definition, if you see here, I'm not using the Y operator. So this is the difference between this construct and the other constructs. Here, I'm using the Q and Z uh, options provided by T-Shark for me, which allows me to inspect uh, some statistical information about the packet, okay? So here, what I'm checking for, all ICMP of type three and code three, and the counting the number of frames that matches this uh, display filter logic, or this filter's logic, I shouldn't say display filter, this filter's logic, okay? And for what interval? The interval is to be given through the input, uh, the arg input operator, okay? So when I go to the shell, I type black nurse, so all it's expecting from me is the interval value, right? For example, I give it, Give me the list of all frames, or not, well not the list of all frames, the number of frames that match this specification, uh, this uh, filter in one second, right? Because as I mentioned, for this attack to succeed, you would need to send the same packet, ICMP packet, at a rate of 40 to 50,000, right? So this is a way for you to test it. It's as simple as that. And here I'm using, of course, the insert, op the insert operator to reference the auxiliary logic or the macro that I defined outside of the construct. As simple as that. Now for collaboration. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, I said that you can use the include preprocessing directive, and this gives you a lot of power actually. So the scenario I envision for collaboration is as follows. First, you store the CMD file, the master CMD file, on a network share, right? You store it on a network share. And in the configuration file, where you define the path to that CMD file, you point it to that CMD file where you placed on the network share, right? And from there, in that file, you use the included preprocessing directive, pointing back to your directory, to where you have SPF stored, the actual framework, right? And everyone else on the network can use the included preprocessor directive in that master file, pointing back to his own directory. And then, once you have that entry pointing back to your uh, path, to your local path, then you can use the, direct, the include directive again, pointing to other CMD files local to your own directory. I know it's a bit complicated, but it's, it is literally simple once you start using it. And then once you define a construct, it becomes available to everyone else, 
right? So this is a way of sharing it and democratizing the sharing of these constructs. It's really that simple. So I don't need to implement any fancy stuff in terms of networking or anything like that. Of course, it's not over the internet. This is just local to your network, but at least you can uh, share its usage. And mind you, I know this might sound like a bit complicated here. I ha there's good documentation on how to use the framework, so you need not worry about uh, uh, the absence of any description, for example, for this slide. Uh, a bit of uh, information about the internals of the uh, framework. So for example, the SPF uh, constructs, they are stored under separate data structure. The same thing goes for the uh, wind construct as well. So I make a differentiation between external and internal. So external is what you define, whatever construct you define in the CMD file, and internal is what I define in the framework at, at the language level, like uh, at the C++ level as, as part of the code. And what, why is that? Because sometimes there are certain constructs that you cannot implement just solely based on t shark display filters. You cannot achieve that, whatever it is that you're trying to achieve. So at the code level, I have the privilege to write those powerful constructs and make them available for you. And things to note, uh, error reporting for these constructs, like whenever you try to validate them from the shell, is limited. So however, to verify that your construct is working as expected, when you do the get all commands, and it shows up in the list of all commands supported, then it is guaranteed that it's gonna work. Like this is the ultimate conclusion that it's gonna work, okay? And other things that you need to be aware of, the order of evaluation of all these input operators, uh, it matters a lot. Again, all of these are listed in the documentation file, okay? In details. Uh, this is for your own reference in case you're wondering, oh, why my construct is not working, right? So you go to this uh, particular paragraph. Performance? I mean, this goes without saying. The performance is dependent on t right? Because I'm not implementing the dissection for these uh, protocols in my framework. I'm leveraging the power of t to do this work for me, right? So every time I call a construct, it goes through t -shark. It's not natively implemented. And there is a drawback for that, of course. Future work, this is what I'm planning, planning to implement. A DGA-based detection algorithm that is not to be done through an external con construct, but an, an internal construct, and make it available for you as a, an exposable object. Uh, detecting different vulnerabilities that you cannot even do with uh, your typical IDS device, whether it's a Snort or any other fancy IDS you're using. And open sourcing the framework. As I mentioned, this is a personal project. I was uh, exploring different features of C++. So I, I would be literally implementing the same function, but in a different way, just to explore the new feature of C++. And that's the reason why I haven't open sourced the framework as of yet. So I need to refactor the code and do a lot of stuff for that. And I'm actually planning to implement natively uh, some of the protocol, and in particular HTTP, so that I have a greater control over it, instead of just invoking those uh, display filters via t -shark. And for you to know, all you Wireshark fanatics, it is buggy. I'm not sure how much experience you have with Wireshark, especially the dissectors and the parsers. These are two different things. They are buggy. They miss some of the fields. Uh, even some of the display filters don't even work, depending on how you capture your uh, PCAP file. And of course, I'm working on this, uh, this feature that I, I'm already working on it, and, uh, but I haven't finished the implementation yet. I'm not gonna talk about it. <laughs> it's gonna take at least a minimum of three minutes. It's not that easy to implement as well. There is a lot of thinking behind it. Uh, I was hoping to finish it before the conference, but it seems not gonna happen. And framework availability is, you can go to my site and download it. Uh, there's, I fixed some bugs, but I haven't updated the, uh, the version that's already on my site. Demo, unfortunately, we don't have time. <laughs> and for summary, yeah, we've talked about the framework. Uh, we introduced uh, the new language. I showed some of the case studies and references. 
if you want to learn about display filters, wire shark filters, these are the different things, except the uh, semantics. And T shark credits, just the icon I use at the, at the beginning of the slides, the first slide, I got it from here, just uh, like for legal reasons, I need to mention this. And thank you all for attending my talk. Thank you.